Hi everyone and welcome to this revision video for Philip Larkin's poem Sonny Pristatin. Um, this is for those of you who are studying the AQA course in English Literature for specification B uh, and also those of you who are studying comedy not tragedy. This video forms part of a, um, of a number of videos that I'm doing, a collection of videos that I'm doing, all about these comedy poems. There's seven of them in total, including The Flea, Tam O'Shanter, and Not My Best Side, Mr Sisyphus, and others. So if you want to have a look at those videos as well, please feel free to have a flick through my back catalogue of videos and find those videos as well. The aims of this session uh, will be for AO2, to go through the, to analyse the poem, to go through the key annotations of the poem for AO2, or to do with meanings and methods. For AO1, I'm going to be going through some of the key literary concepts and terminology, terms associated with literary study. For AO3, I'm going to be going through the social and historical context, which complements uh, the analysis of this poem. And for AO4, to link this poem to comedy and the comedy genre. To remind you, as A-level students, you will be analysing texts through the lens of a particular genre. And for this poem, it is through the, through the lens of comedy. So you don't only have to know the texts really well, but you also need to know how they fit into the comedy tradition. And to do that, you need to know what are the characteristics of comedy or the aspects of comedy, which is the overall module title um, for this comedy unit. So to begin with then, let me show you two images. And if you think about it, this poem was written in the mid 20th century. We're talking about the 1950s. And that was before we had internet. Imagine that, no social media, no internet. How on earth did people survive? Um, but what was common though, because there was no internet for advertising, it would be more common for people to put up posters. And sometimes you will see big billboards um, around towns that have these huge posters on as a form of advertising. You might argue they're not very effective anymore because of the Internet and how easy it is to advertise on social media and things. But before the Internet, obviously, um, things still had to be advertised. And it was very common as well for seaside resorts in the UK to be advertised by traditional seaside posters, which would be put up. And here we have two examples, one for Pristatin. Uh, which is what this poem is about, where this poem is about. And we have one for Bognor Regis. Um, so very traditional seaside resorts like Weymouth and Blackpool, Bognor Regis, Eastbourne, Brighton, Bournemouth, all these very traditional kind of staycation seaside resorts that all had piers and things, um, would have been advertised um, by these posters to draw people in to the, to the, um, to the seaside resort and spend their money there. This was, of course, a time when people didn't really tend to go abroad as much for holidays. You will notice that the poster on the left is specifically for the seaside resort that this poem is about, Pristatin, which is on the North Welsh coast, uh, just along from Anglesey. Um, and the woman in this poster is very similar to the one that would have been in the, in the poster that Larkin saw. Very tight bathing suit, uh, kneeling on the sand, the difference being her bathing costume is red instead of white. It's white in the poem. But you can see that in both of these images, the image of a woman is used and perhaps sexualised to make the seaside resort seem very alluring, very exotic, very idealised. Uh, you can see both of these women are wearing very tight bathing suits, which accentuates their femininity, their breasts, their thighs and so on. For AO3, for theory, some of you might already have looked at feminist theory and this idea of the male gaze, which is the idea that um, it is assumed that the viewer of films or the reader of texts is male. And you could argue that the reason why the advertiser chose to put a very alluring, uh, attractive woman on these posters is because they are, it is consistent with being seen from the male gaze. The idea that if a man saw this, a heterosexual man saw this, it would mean that that seaside resort would look particularly alluring. But obviously with advertising, as is always the case, uh, adverts tend to be very idealised um, in order to make them, I suppose, more persuasive to a viewer. So the poster on the left here is the one really which is very similar to the poster that Larkin would have used as the source 
of this poem. So, a summary of this poem, um, quite a simple poem in many respects, typical of Larkin. Larkin, as one of the main 20th century poets in English literature, he was asked to be poet laureate but turned it down. So Ted Hughes became the poet laureate instead, uh, known as sometimes Sylvia Plath's husband. So in this poem, Larkin watches a poster advertising a seaside resort, gradually but getting defaced, uh, being vandalised. Typical of Larkin, Larkin will use something very trivial and something very simple, but ascribe to it a deeper philosophy. And that's very typical of Larkin. Um, he will often use something very simple, a simple place or a simple object, and turn it into a much more deeper analysis of humanity or, um, you know, other themes like love and other and, the, and memory and time and mortality. The poster presents an image of a young woman in a sexualized pose, common at the time as a marketing tool and appeal to the male gaze. We've already talked about that. Larkin uses the poster to mock commercialism and present a disparity between the unattainable, the utopian lifestyle of the poster to the reality of society, shown through the behaviour of Titch Thomas and the nameless others. So Titch Thomas, one of the men who vandalised the image of this woman on this poster. Utopian means perfect, um, you know, lovely place to be. And that's what advertising sometimes does. It presents to us an unattainable utopian way of living which clashes with the reality of life. Um, so that is uh, a, a general summary of the poem. So the key terms and uh, literary concepts for this poem. One of the key terms is taboo. And a taboo is a topic that people often find controversial or difficult to talk about, such as death, bodily functions and sex. However, each of those things are often common aspects of comedy, actually, or common themes in comedy, because comedy is concerned with what it is to be human. Uh, humanity's shortfalls, humanity's foibles, um, the absurdity of humans, the mistakes, the errors that we make in order to be, I suppose, slightly self-deprecating. So when you have a text which is looking at a taboo issue, um, it will bring it up, it will talk about them as a way to laugh at them, and by laughing at them it makes it more approachable to us, more bearable to talk about. If you think about it, we have lots of comedians out there, and if you, you know, switch on channels on, on the TV, a lot of uh, a material that a, comedy, that a comedian will use will be about these things. They will make jokes about death, they'll make jokes about them going to the toilet, they'll make jokes about them, you know, in their sex lives. Um, so taboo topics often form part of the comedic tradition, and this is no different. This poem is also about something taboo. Typical of Larkin, Larkin will use colloquialisms, which is informal language and slang. Larkin's style is always very blunt, and he will speak in a very informal way. The poem will also use irony, um, and irony really is a difference between what is said and what is meant. Uh, or a difference between expectation and reality. We'll come back to that in a second. And you can also call this poem a dark acerbic satire. Uh, and a satire is a type of humour which aims to expose and condemn particular behaviour, perhaps particular faults or flaws, perhaps to bring about some kind of change or just to shed light on it. So you could say that because Larkin is focusing on the way this poster was defaced by people, probably men, Larkin is trying to question why this happens and trying to maybe answer, you know, what is it about people that try and make things less beautiful? What What is it that they can't deal with when they see something beautiful? What are they trying to do by vandalising it? So you can also call this, for AO1, a dark acerbic satire. The social and historical context for AO3, we're talking here about 1950s Britain and more specifically, a traditional seaside resort on the North Wales coast. Um, the poster which Larkin sees being defaced is obviously pre-internet age, so it would have been more common then to have physical adverts like posters around the place to, to advertise a particular thing or a particular place to go. So this poem is really about consumerism, and Larkin really is mocking, I suppose, the disparity between a utopian lifestyle which advertising presents to us and how it can be quite shallow and, and like a facade, but also, I suppose, society's general cynicism about a way of life and how society refuses to accept those ideals 
and bring the poster back to earth, I suppose. So there's a conflict between the utopian world of the advert and the reality of life. Um, typical of Larkin, he will use a very trivial or simple object like the poster, but ascribes to it a deeper philosophical meaning. Um, there is also in this poem a degree of sexual politics uh, because of the way in which the image and the scribbles and the vandalism of this poster can be seen as quite sexualized and how um, this woman's image is tarnished and her beauty is taken away in what you might call quite a cruel manner, perhaps. Um, you can also link this to the gradual decline of the traditional British seaside resort as more people spent their money abroad. So if you go to many, I suppose, traditional seaside resorts like Weymouth, um, like Blackpool, like Bournemouth, uh, Eastbourne, no disrespect to the people that might like going to these resorts or who live there, but those resorts have lost the same charm that they would have had maybe 70 years ago post-war because they haven't had as many tourists going to them they have some of them have fallen into a little bit of decline and there are videos on YouTube of Pristatin and it doesn't particularly paint Pristatin in, in any particularly glorified way. Um, so this poem really is about class, it's about masculinity and it's also to some extent about sex, which is also a taboo. So let's jump into then the anal analysis of this poem and look at the first stanza. It starts by saying, Come to Sonny Pristatin, laugh the girl on the poster, kneeling up on the sand in tautened white satin. Behind her, a hunk of coast, a hotel with palms seemed to expand from her thighs and spread breast lifting arms. So the first line is in italics. It's an imperative. It's a command. And it's the um, sentence that Larkin is copying off the poster itself. Um, we also got the adjective sunny, which is comes to the irony of this poem. That will become more clear as we go actually into the second stanza, so I might come back to that. But there is irony in the adjective sunny. This first stanza is very positive in terms of its vocabulary. Um, it has words like laughed in it. It has words like hunk of coast, a hotel with palms, which creates a, almost a, a false sense of the exotic. It almost seems Mediterranean here. We, remember, we're not talking about the Mediterranean. We're talking about North Wales and no disrespect to North Wales. But if you go to Pristatin, there aren't many palm trees. Uh, it's not the same glamour as we would expect from the Mediterranean. So it sets us up for a fall almost, this first stanza. It lures us into a false sense of security. The it's also, you know, we've also got a girl on the poster, not a woman, but a girl. So that also the noun girl. Um, reinforces her innocence, I suppose. We have a verb phrase, kneeling up, which, like on the poster I showed you at the beginning of this video, suggests that she's, she's maybe inferior or powerlessness compared to her viewers. You could link that to the male gaze, I suppose, and this sexualised image of the woman to make this hotel resort, or this seaside resort rather, seem alluring, which conflicts with the reality of this resort, what it's actually like. The girl is also wearing tautened white satin, adjective tautened meaning quite pulled tightly across her body, so quite sexualised, and white connotations of um, innocence and purity. Um, satin or obviously very smooth as well. So it's almost as if she's being presented as very innocent, very young and very perfect almost. Um, we've got the noun hunk as well, um, which has connotations of strength and masculinity. So you might have the juxtaposition between the innocence and the femininity of the woman contrasted with the strength of masculinity, perhaps. And towards the bottom of this stanza, we're told that the way in which she is posing on this poster um, kind of um, emphasises her breasts, it emphasises her thighs, which are both um, quite sexualised for women. Um, and it will appeal to the main gaze, the, the male gaze. So again, this first stanza is all to do with kind of creating a false sense of the exotic, a false sense of utopia. Because look at what happens when we go into that second stanza. She was slapped up one day in March, 
a couple of weeks and her face was snaggle-toothed and boss-eyed. Huge tits and a fissured crotch were scored well in, and the space between her legs held scrawls that set her fairly astride a tuberous cock and balls. Okay, so you can tell straight away from that first sentence, the tone completely changes. We go to something more brutal, more vivid, slightly more grotesque in a way. So we've got that end stop declarative sentence. We call it we call it end stopped because it's got a full stop at the end. So it really emphasizes that statement. Um, so we go from the exotic and the pleasurable and almost the Mediterranean to something more graphic and more vivid. Um, and it completely conflicts with that kind of pretense of the first stanza. We've also got that verb phrase slapped up, which not only links to both sexual violence, uh, but also the way in which maybe the person that put the poster up did so in a very careless way. Uh, you know, you can almost you sometimes see them when they put up these big posters on billboards around town. You can see there's a man on a ladder with a big stick with it, which with kind of like wallpaper paste really slapping up this poster, not really caring about what's on the poster, just putting the poster up. So we get connotations here of, of sexual violence and also violation. So the poem becomes slightly more darker here. A couple of weeks because over a couple of weeks Larkin watches these uh, men probably um, for entertainment um, vandalising this image and making the image of this girl um, into something that they want to use as a way of creating laughter. And again, we get some colloquialisms in this in this second stanza, typical of Larkin. So she's called Snaggletooth and boss eyed so her pupils have been drawn on her face to make her look boss eyed which means her pupils are going in different directions. Somebody has coloured in her teeth, so it looks like she's got teeth missing as well. So typical of Larkin, vivid, honest, uncompromising description. We can also call snaggletooth boss eyed as compound epithets because they are, you know, comparing two things together with hyphens. We're also told that the way in which the men defaced this poster was very forceful because it was scored well in. So they've taken great effort to almost, you know, really forcefully press their pen into the image of this woman in, a, in an attempt to, I suppose, draw pubic hair. Really take away her beauty and her innocence and turn her into something more real, I suppose, between her legs. So there's a sense there of violation. And again, typical of Larkin, colloquialisms, they draw onto her a tuberous cock and balls. So somebody has drawn on their male genitalia. And then as we go into the third stanza, that dark tone, I suppose, continues. So autograph pitch Thomas while someone had used a knife or something to stab right through the moustache lips of her smile. She was too good for this life. Very soon, a great transverse tear left only a hand and some blue. Now fight cancer is there. And that's the end of the poem. OK, so you can see that we get reference to this kind of alliterative Titch Thomas, which is one of the men who puts their name to this vandalism. Um, so you could argue that maybe a small man rebelling against expected behaviour, they know by defacing this image of the woman that they shouldn't be doing it, but they're doing it anyway, perhaps, as a way of rebelling against the utopian vision of the advertising world. Uh, in other words, stop presenting to us unattainable images and give us something more real that we can um, relate to. Notice as well, we also get consistent reference to pronouns she and her, which makes this girl seem real. It makes her seem like a real woman. Actually, as we know, it's just an image of a woman. But Larkin almost personifies this woman by using those pronouns, which heightens the sense of sympathy that we might have for her. We've also got the noun knife and the verb stab, which again creates connotations of violence and sexual violation. So again, the dark undercurrents continue. Somebody had drawn a moustache on her top lip, again, as a way of tarnishing her beauty. And we get another declarative sentence that's also end stopped. She was too good for this life. Which means that Larkin perhaps is suggesting that he's disappointed at how society felt the need to change the poster. And he's disappointed that the beauty of the woman was destroyed, perhaps. 
Um, over the course of two weeks, as often is the case in this country when we have lots of rain, um, paper outside starts to tear. And that's what happens to this poster because a great transverse tear uh, started to occur. And what happened was the poster was so ripped over a period of two weeks that it only left the woman's hand showing and some blue of the sky. So the poster becomes ripped and it really disintegrates, really. And the poster at the end of the poem uh, is now about cancer. So the poster is replaced with another poster about cancer. Maybe Larkin is suggesting that the men's behaviour has been cancerous um, in, in society. Maybe he's suggesting that cancer is not utopian, it's real. And therefore, people will leave that poster alone, perhaps, because it's not about presenting a utopian lifestyle, which the girl did, perhaps. So you can see the overall structure of this poem. The first stanza is very exotic, but it sets us up for a fall because in the second and the third stanza, the tone becomes a lot darker. It becomes much more concerned with violation, sexual violence. And going back to that theme of irony that I mentioned before, Remember in that first stanza, we were told about the word sunny, and that, that adjective sunny also appears in the title. Not a lot in this poem is very sunny, and you can now see why that title is quite ironic, because not a lot in this poem is actually positive or sunny. So that the title itself, again, like that first stanza, sets us up for a fall. Uh, there's a complete disparity be between what we expect from the title and that first stanza, and what we actually end up reading, which is a poem about really quite grotesque, quite vivid treatment of this girl on the poster, but maybe broadening it out women more generally, perhaps. So moving on to AO4, um, what aspects of comedy can this poem be linked to? So in other words, why has this poem been included on a comedy specification? And many students struggle with this a little bit for this poem, because actually, if it wasn't for Larkin's tone, um, then I suppose that this could be actually more of a tragic poem. Um, but there are reasons why this has been put on a comedy spec. So firstly, part of comedy is the presentation of taboo, because by laughing at things, um, we are making those uh, topics more bearable and more uh, approachable to talk about. Uh, and I gave you some examples at the beginning. So because of the reference to sex and, and I suppose, um, you know, the dark undercurrents in this poem, it is quite a taboo poem and it proves that comedy can sometimes come from what is slightly uncomfortable and what is edgy. Um, the behaviour of the men that vandalise this poster are doing it probably for a prank. They're not doing it on their own. They're doing it probably in groups as a way to assert their masculinity, perhaps. Look at me. Aren't I brilliant for, you know, aren't I a proper lad for, you know, doodling on this image? So there's an element of pranking. It's quite crude. But it's also done quite mindlessly as, as like the fun of it, just for laughter. The, as we've said, the tone of the poem is full of colloquialisms and informal expression, which is typical of Larkin, but also typical of comedy generally, really. But it's also a satirical depiction of society. So that word satirical means that it's much more com comedic than tragic. Um, this is Larkin's way, I suppose, of mocking consumerism, mocking the post-war advertising world and saying basically that Advertising is very utopian, but doesn't do a, a, a service really to representing the reality of, of our lives. You could say it also shows the foolishness or flaws of mankind. It has a lot of dark undercurrents, and dark undercurrents is again part of the comedic tradition. Not everything is fluffy comedy. You know, sometimes comedy can be dark, it can be edgy. It's also showing a break from formality. So, in other words, the joy of rule breaking. Um, the joy of doing something you know you're not supposed to do, but you do it anyway because you think it's going to be funny. So that is another aspect of the comedy tradition. But it also has quite, I suppose, high relatability. Um, we know, I suppose, what Larkin is talking about here. Uh, we know what it's like to see something that has been drawn on. We know what it's like maybe in school to use a dictionary that has the school has had for 30 years and over the years, students have drawn things in it. Um, so we know what it's like to see this. And we might have done it ourselves uh, over the years. We might have had a magazine by us and a pen. And we just mindlessly doodled on this person's face for entertainment purposes, just because we wanted to. So you could also say that what Larkin is talking about here 
is not too difficult to imagine and we can relate to it in a way as well. And that's also part of the comedic tradition. Finally, the last slide of this presentation. Why is this poem comedic? So Larkin balances humour with disgust, colloquialisms with pessimism to shock the reader through sharp language and imagery. Uh, and as I've said, the poem proves that sometimes what is funny can come from what is dark and serious and also edgy and taboo. Again, I ask you to think about your favourite comedian or to think about videos that you have watched on TikTok or Snapchat. Sometimes they can have quite a dark undercurrent to them. So and, and, and comedians can often have material which is that sails quite close to the wire, quite close to the wind. Um, and sometimes comedians get themselves into trouble because they go too far. Um, so, again, taboo and serious subject matter can often be used in comedy. It's sometimes called, I suppose, black comedy. Um, the poster presents a degree of triviality. It is a simple object um, and very commonly noticed as well. But Larkin is using that poster to show the difference, the disparity between the utopian world of advertising and its you know, representations of our lives and what actually life is like, the reality of our life. The irony of the title and the clash between the first stanza and the second and third is also comedic because of the irony. It's, so, it's not so much sunny, uh, it sets us up for a false sense of expectation. It could also show a presentation of flawed behaviour, particularly flawed male behaviour, and men or people generally, I suppose, rebelling against expected behaviour from society. Um, we have Larkin's compound epithets, snaggletoothed, boss-eyed. So Larkin's depiction and his description of these scribbles could also be seen as comedic in the way in which he's describing them to us in this very vivid way. Finally, the tone could be seen as quite crass, but also on a deeper level, more philosophical level, a, a quite a complex poem, which on the surface depicts men partaking in a prank. And I've put there, how many of you would laugh if you picked up a magazine in the doctor's surgery and saw someone had doodled on an image of someone? Uh, or how many would you be offended at that? That happens a lot, as I just said, with a dictionary idea. You go into your bookcase at school and find a dictionary that's been there for 30 years. Chances are students have doodled on it over the years or, you know, or defaced something somewhere near you. And again, so it's very relatable, this poem. So he uses a very trivial, simple image of a, of a poster of a woman advertising a seaside resort and turns it into a much more of a phys philosophical debate about advertising, commercialism, but also this disparity between expected behaviour and reality, but also the utopian world of advertising and reality as well. So it's really because of the tone and the irony and the, um, the satire of this poem, which is why it's on a comedy specification. Comedy sometimes does come from what is edgy, what is taboo and what is dark. So hopefully this video has helped in your revision of Sonny Pristatin. Thank you.